What a wonderful moment we have right now to come before the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Savior of the world, the one who literally can take away our shame and our regret and just give him praise and honor. And I want to challenge you to do that this morning. Whether you're here with us or tuning in online, I just pray that you'll open up your hearts and that you'll sing and worship our God. You are not a God created by human hands. You are not a God dependent on any mortal man. You are not a God. So glad you're here today. We are here to worship this unchangeable, unstoppable God. It's awesome to think that all around the world, people are worshiping this same God, the one and only true God, the King of kings and Lord of lords. I want to welcome you this morning. We're so glad you're here. My name is Casey Cockerham. I'm the Discipleship and Connections Director. I'm filling in today as Darren is still out. Uh, Darren and Jen and their family are quarantining because his father uh, got COVID, and then they are about to head out on a, a kind of a, a mini local vacation. So please be praying for the Canary family. This morning, if you're visiting with us, we are especially glad that you're here. We always are so happy to have guests with us. If you are, I want to encourage you to grab right in the pew in front of you one of these connection cards. And if you would fill that out, um, that just gives us a record of your visit. We will not hound you with emails. You will not be stuck on our email list for eternity. 
that type of stuff. We just want to get to know you. We'll shoot you an email saying, welcome, thanks for coming, and seeing if you have any questions. You can also, on the back of this, mark any questions that you might have. If you are watching online, we want to welcome you as well. You also can fill out a connection card by going to our app. If you don't have our app, just go to your app store and search for FCC Wachula, and you can click sign up, and then you can fill out the connection card online. So again, we're so glad you're here today. We're going to have an awesome day of worship, an awesome time in the Word, and we have a few announcements for you as we get going. They are going to be shared via video. Well, good morning, FCC. I have this morning's announcement, so please take a look. Well, this morning, I want to start off by reminding everybody that you can find all of our announcements every week in our app. And along with the announcements, you can find plenty of other things as well. You can give online through the app. You can uh, find out more about life groups or some of the focus groups that are starting. Uh, you can go back and watch past sermons. So if you don't have our app, you can always find it in your app store, whichever uh, phone you have or whatever device you're using. You can find it in their app, in the app store. And all you have to do is search for FCC Wachula, and it'll pop right up, and it'll look like this. So we hope you'll download the app and check out there uh, for more details on anything you hear in the announcements. Well, if you're not involved in a life group, now is a great time to get involved with one. We've started back after the holidays, and if you're interested in joining one, you can always ask Casey uh, if you want to get any information about one, uh, if you want recommendations. Otherwise, you can find all the information about our life groups and focus groups. You can find them online or back in our app. So we hope you'll join us for one of the small groups or focus groups this year. Well, coming up Sunday, February 7th, is one of the highlights of... Uh, our FCC family, we have an event called the Family Football Fun Day, and it's a great day. We go out to the Hardy Stadium, and uh, that afternoon we have games, prizes, food. Uh, it's just a fantastic day to hang out with uh, your church family and have some fun. So if you like football, or even if you don't like football, this is a great event to attend. Now, it's right after church, coming up February 7th, so we hope you'll plan on marking your calendar and joining us for Family Football Fun Day this year. Well, February is an exciting month. We have lots going on, as I mentioned, the Family Football Fun Day, but we also have the Hardy County Fair. And this is a great opportunity for FCC to go out into the community and really make an impact. Uh, many of you have been involved in the past, and we're always looking for lots of volunteers. Now, if you're interested in volunteering and helping out with one of the aspects of the fair, uh, we have a mandatory meeting coming up on Sunday, January 31st. It'll be right after church for just a few minutes. You can get all the details, but we want you to sign up in the app. So if you'll grab your phone, sign up on the app, and let us know that you're planning on participating and being a part of our uh, outreach to the Hardy County Fair this year. Well, this morning, if you did not have an opportunity to grab communion supplies as you entered at the worship center this morning, you can get up and do so right now. We're going to be having a moment of communion here in just a few minutes. Also, another way to participate in worship is through your giving. So if you want to give your tithes and offerings, you can do so one of three different ways. You can use the app, you can text to give, or you can use the black boxes in the back of the worship center. Well, thanks for watching this morning. We are going to turn our attention back to worship. So he said we're going to turn our attention back to worship. We're going to sing a couple of songs together in this particular moment, that form of worship. But before we sing this next song, I kind of kind of just want to get your mindset and maybe connect it to your heart just a little bit for a minute. I mean, I really don't know where you are when you came in this morning, but we're about to sing words that say things like, you are here moving in our midst. You are here working in this place. You, you are here touching every heart, healing every heart, turning lives around, mending every heart. We're going to sing these words all saying, you are here doing that, Father. Holy Spirit. But I, I just I kind of want to acknowledge with you for just a minute that when we when we sing those words, they're really only gonna be true for us if we let him move in our hearts. If we if we kind of open up and say, I am here, Father, and I want to worship you. 
and I want you to come and move in me. And I don't want to be the same when I leave this place as I was when I arrived. I, I know that's my heart for me personally. I don't want to be the same today with this encounter, this moment that I have with Jesus. I want to be different when I leave. And that can happen when we just really kind of set all of our defenses down and we acknowledge that he is with us in this place. And when you sing words like that, to me, one of the best choices we could make is sing them with the heart of, here I am, Father. Move in me. Touch my heart. Mend my broken pieces. And I'm going to choose in this particular moment right now, Lord, that even when I can't see it, I'm going to believe and know that you're working. That's kind of the thought process behind a song like what we're about to sing. Because just like the chorus of this song says, he is the way maker. And even when we can't see whatever that way might be, he has already seen it. And he is already moving if we just allow ourselves to be moved by him. So I hope you'll worship with us and open your hearts.
worship you. I'm gonna worship you forever. Come on, sing that. Let me get our prayer. I'm gonna worship you. It's a declaration. I'm gonna worship you. Just you. I'm gonna worship you forever. Come on. worshiping uh, Jesus, I want to kind of take just a moment and uh, read a passage from Colossians chapter 1. In verse 21, it says, once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you a holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. You know, the book of Job tells us that Satan is the great accuser. He accuses the saints. Those things that we do that are sin, that displease God, Satan is always there ready to point out our faults. And sometimes he does it in our own minds and in our own hearts. But Colossians says that Jesus reconciled us. In the book of Hebrews, Jesus is called the mediator between God and man. In other words, he took two parties that were at odds with each other, us, mankind, and God, and reconciled them together. He made them see eye to eye, made it so that both parties were no longer at war with each other. And that's something to be grateful and thankful for this morning. You know, it says that he did that through his physical death, which is what we're going to remember at this moment. As most of us probably already have our communion supplies, we have the body and blood of Jesus. And it's not his actual body and blood. They're, They're symbols, they're elements, they're pictures of what Jesus did for us. When he offered his body willingly on that cross, he was doing so so that we could be made right with God. I mean, if you think about it, we were, it says, at at war. We were enemies with him. But because of what Jesus did on the cross, we are no longer enemies. And the Bible says that Jesus gives, gives us his righteousness, his holiness. We have the ability to stand in the presence of God because he no longer sees us as enemies, but as children of the king. This morning, as we get ready to partake, I want you to think about it just for a few moments before you partake. Think about what Jesus has forgiven you, what Jesus has done for you to wipe away all of your sins, all of your mistakes, so that Satan can no longer accuse you of what you've done. Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you that we have a high priest, a mediator, and his name is Jesus. And he, on our behalf, did everything he needed to to reconcile, to make things right between us and you. And God, there isn't a single one of us that deserve it. 
Actually, we are far from uh, being worthy of what Jesus did for us. But we know he did it for us because he loves us. And so, Father, as we take just a moment to reflect and remember what Jesus did on the cross for us, reconciling us to you, God, I pray that we would be so thankful. And as we partake of these elements, the, the body and blood of Jesus, may we remember that he offered his body willingly, that he offered his blood as a sacrifice so that we were no longer enemies of you, but that we could be called sons and daughters. God, we thank you so much for Jesus and his sacrifice, which is what we remember at this moment. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.
an awesome song, and um, I don't want to spend too long talking about this, and I don't want to get too carried away with it, because I need to uh, press on and, and make time for the sermon, but um, like many weeks in this past year, I know we're in a new year, um, this has been a, a difficult week, hasn't it? Just watching the news and seeing things going on in the midst of our country, and uh, while I want to focus on the sermon, I also don't want to ignore uh, what's going on in our world around us. And as we think about uh, the song we just sang, uh, I know there are all kinds of different personalities, different thought processes, different political points of view uh, represented in this room. Um, but as I was singing that song, I was just thinking about the fact that this world is not our home. And sometimes it feels like the ocean waves are higher than what we can handle, or maybe we're even caught in a kind of tidal wave type of deal. And uh, when, you're, when your focus and when your hope is in uh, our government or a nation or mankind, uh, you're going to kind of constantly feel like that. Uh, but the song says that I will turn my eyes to God. And as believers, I just hope for us here at FCC, and I hope other believers in our nation, others can see us turning our eyes to God. Instead of hopping on Twitter or Facebook or Instagram and spewing opinions, let's turn to prayer. Because God is our only hope. 
And uh, we are about one kingdom, his kingdom. We are citizens of that kingdom. Um, so just want to encourage us to keep our hope there this morning. As we get going into this, uh, this new sermon series, Becoming and Making Disciples, this morning I want us to, and even on, on the heels of what I was just talking about, think about our purpose. Uh, both our purpose as individuals and our purpose as a church, because there are a few things in life that are as important as finding your purpose. When you understand your sense of purpose, you can put up with all kinds of inconvenience and pain because of it. For example, I want you to imagine this scenario. Imagine that your boss calls you into the office on a weekend. He or she wants you to come in on a Saturday to open up a stack of 10,000 envelopes and sort through the contents. No overtime pay, just weekend work. How would you feel? You'd be incredibly resentful, right? That would be the worst weekend ever. But imagine that he or she told you that in one of those letters, there was a $100,000 bonus check for you, and you needed to find it. You'd be opening those suckers like Wonka bars, wouldn't you? <laughs> Same tedious job. The difference is in your sense of purpose. Or how about being a doctor and having to tell a woman that she has a condition that's going to make her waistline grow 10 inches and gain 30 pounds over the next few months. If you're that doctor, you might fear that she would punch you in the face. But if the cause of that weight gain and the, the bigger waistline was a long-awaited pregnancy that she had been hoping for, she might give you a hug, right? Again, the conditions are the same. The difference is the perception of purpose. When we know our purpose, it makes a huge difference. That being said, I've found that it's easier for us to know the purpose of something, but over the course of time, forget what it is. Before, before coming here to FCC, I was the executive director of a faith-based nonprofit, and when I began that job, I went into the community and I began asking people about their perception of our organization. I began asking them what they thought the purpose of our organization was, and to my dismay, I got lots of different answers. In other words, they didn't know. It was not clear. At our next board meeting, I sat down with our board of directors and I asked them to go around the room one by one and tell me what they thought the purpose of our organization was. Sadly, and to my shock, I got lots of different answers again from our board of directors. And the reason that shocked me is because these were people that were giving time, treasure, and talents to the organization. Some of them were giving tens of thousands of dollars to our organization and they didn't know the purpose. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine giving lots of time and using your talents and sacrificing your time and your money, but not knowing why something existed? Well, this morning, I want us to think about that. What is the purpose of church? What does it exist to do? Because I know that you give your time to the church, you give your talents, you serve the church, many of you give lots of money to the church, but how much time do you spend thinking about why the church exists and what it exists to do? You may not know this, but about 15 years ago, one of the nation's biggest churches at that time, one of the, the mega churches in the U.S. called Willow Creek Community Church in Chicago, they did a survey of their church. They wanted to do some, some uh, data collection on how they were doing as a church, and the premise that they had had going into this survey was my iPad here is freaking out, which is not good in the middle of your sermon. Wow, it's just skipping all the, it wants me to be done. Is that, are you guys praying for this sermon to be over? <laughs> it's just skipping through all the pages, that's crazy. The premise of this study was that they wanted to see if what they thought was true is that being active and being involved in the life of the church would, would translate into someone growing more spiritually. And what they found through that survey was that was not true. The results did not show that that was a corollary response. Even though people had gotten busier and gotten involved in more things in the life of the church, that did not necessarily result in them growing <laughs> as, as a believer. Does anybody know why a program would skip to the last page and not just stay on the page you're on? 
if you're a techie, you might come help me out because it is not wanting to stay on the page I'm on. And that will make this sermon very interesting and perhaps a lot longer, which nobody wants. But I want us to understand that if we, yeah, I would love that. Thank you so much, Christy. It's always great to have a hard copy of your sermon so Christy's going to bring that up to me. But Willow Creek did this study, and they found out that there, what they thought was true, that if people were busier and busier, thank you so much, if they were busier and busier in the life of the church, that did not necessarily translate to them growing in their faith. And so they had to rethink a lot of what they were doing. And of course, this being one of the mega churches in America, a lot of other churches were copying what they were doing because they thought, well, if they're so big, they must be doing something right. So we'll do what they're doing. But then, of course, they found out that what they were doing was not necessarily resulting in what they wanted it to result in. So thankfully, Jesus both taught and modeled for us what the church is to be about. Jesus' last command, we see it in Matthew 28, verses 8 through 20. It's often referred to as the Great Commission, says this, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. The church is called to reach the person, the world for Jesus one person at a time. That's the mission of the church to reach the world for Jesus one person at a time. During the Last Supper, before Jesus was arrested and taken to the cross, he prayed with his disciples. And in his prayer, he said to the Father, I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. I want you to think about this for a second. Jesus had not yet gone to the cross. He had not died on the cross for our sins. He had not been resurrected from the grave, defeating the powers of sin and death. And yet in his prayer to God, he said, I have completed the work you have given me to do. Have you ever thought about that? What did he do? What work did he complete if he hadn't gone to the cross yet, if he hadn't been resurrected yet? Let's look at this passage and see. It says in John chapter 17, verses 4 through 8, this is Jesus praying. He said, I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. I've revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. For I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. In his prayer here, Jesus explains that he had completed the work of making disciples. Have you ever noticed that? For me, when I paid attention to this, this kind of blew my mind. How could Jesus, before he went to the cross, before he was resurrected, say he had completed the work that God gave him to do? But We have to realize that if Jesus had died on the cross for our sins but had not made disciples who could deliver the message, none of us here today would have heard that good news. He was was creating disciples who could carry on this message so that for thousands and thousands of years, more and more people could come to know him. A few weeks after his resurrection, Jesus commanded 12 men, his disciples, to do the same work that his father had given him to do. And the disciples didn't look at Jesus and say, how are we supposed to do that? They already knew because he had been teaching them. He had been discipling them for the past three years. He had already taught them and giving them a living, living model to follow. So this morning, I want us to think about how can we be sure that FCC is obedient and faithful to continuing this mission of Jesus. There are a few principles that can guide us before we get into the meat of what I want to talk about this morning. A few principles can guide us. The first is we need to clarify the win and narrow the focus. In other words, if you were coaching a sports team, I don't know if you've ever coached like Little League t-ball, it's crazy. You can't explain to them difficult concepts of the game of baseball, right? You have to basically help them to understand how we win. We win by hitting the ball, going around the bases in the right order, 
and coming back around home plate, that gives us a point, and keeping the other team from doing that. You have to help them understand the win, and we need to do the same as a church. What is the win? How do we know if we're winning as a church? It's so easy to lose focus in any organization. It's especially easy in a church because there's so many good things we could be doing, right? And there's so many different personalities here. So many of us have different passions or different pet things that we're interested in, so many causes that we care about, so many ministries that we love being a part of. Inevitably, we want to do it all. But the reality is we can't do it all. And Jesus hasn't called us to do it all, but he did command us to carry on this mission of reaching the world by making disciples. So we have to have a tiger-like grip on that mission, and we have to make it our focus. Scripture is clear that the win for a church is making disciples who can make disciples. We also have to teach less for more. This is a concept that a lot of people in church don't like. But we have to understand that more information does not necessarily equate to spiritual transformation. If we want everyone to remember what is being taught and apply it, less is more. People can only retain so much information. While most of us love to learn as much as possible and we find it fascinating, we can only implement so much life change at a time. That's why the old model of doing Sunday school and coming on Sunday night and coming Wednesday night and maybe another night, it didn't result in super Christians, did it? Trust me, I was part of that my whole childhood. I was at church five or six times a week, and it did not result in super Christians. We can't make 10 different changes to our lives every week of the year. Less is more. The third thing is we want to align all that we do so that we can have maximum impact. If we know that the win for a church is to help people grow spiritually to the point where they can make disciples, we need to ensure that everything we do as a church leads people to that goal. So rather than providing a buffet of options, we want to provide a balanced meal. We want to simplify what we do so that all of our energy and effort leads to making disciples who will make disciples. Now, when we look at Jesus' ministry, we see that he ministered primarily in three different environments. We see that sometimes he preached to the crowds. We see that for the majority of his three years of ministry, he focused on 12 men. And then we also see that other times he would take things to another level still with just three of his friends, Peter, James, and John. So as a church, we want to try to follow his lead. We want to create these same three environments to make disciples. So most people understand, and that's why you're here this morning, most people understand the importance of gathering together as a whole church body each week for worship. We hear a message from God's Word, we celebrate the communion together, we fellowship together, all these types of things. And so we're not going to preach a sermon about that because you get it. That's why you're here. But this morning, I do want to talk about the importance of small groups, kind of the environment Jesus had with his 12 disciples. And then next week, I'm going to preach about an even more intentional discipleship setting of just three or four people. This morning, as we think about small groups, have you ever wondered why Jesus spent so much time with just 12 men? Does that ever seem strange to you? You think about Jesus, the smartest man of all time. He was fully God, fully man. He could do miracles. He obviously could draw a crowd, and yet he spent most of his ministry time with 12 men. I have questions, right? If his, if his goal was to bring salvation to the whole world, why didn't he constantly travel and preach like the Apostle Paul? Why didn't he focus most of his time on crowds so more people could hear the good news? Why didn't he focus primarily on miracles and wow everyone into believing? We may not have answers for these questions, but seeing as how Jesus is God and we are not, apparently spending time with a small group of people and discipling them is the best way to propel God's mission. Think about your own spiritual journey for a moment. How have you grown spiritually? When I think about myself, there are a few primary things that have helped me grow spiritually. One 
is being in church, learning about God, and spending time in the Word myself and learning about God, relating to God. Another is being influenced and encouraged by other believers. And a third is getting put into situations where I had to act on the principles I had learned. In other words, maybe just in life, maybe there was temptation or friends doing this or that, and I had to put my faith into practice. Or, or maybe in the church, I was put into a situation where somebody asked me to maybe like teach in VBS, and I had never taught before, and I had to figure out how to do that. And as I put my faith into practice, I learned. I matured. What I've come to realize is that most spiritual growth is not linear. We don't come to know Christ and just progressively grow very clean and neat and easy for the rest of our lives, right? It's more up and down, forward and backwards. And for a person like me who likes preciseness and formulas and programs, the messiness and the haphazardness of spiritual growth is hard to plan for, but I think this is the brilliance of Jesus' model of working with 12 guys and doing life with them. Because his time with them wasn't focused on a curriculum, Rather, it was life on life as it intersected with everyday realities of life. He ate with them. He traveled with them. He did life with them. And no doubt, there were times where Peter's wife was mad at him, and Peter responded to her wrong, and Jesus said, let's think about that. How did that go for you, Peter? You tend to run your mouth. You tend to be quick to anger. Probably not a great model, huh? So as everyday life resulted in life-on-life relationships, they grew spiritually. And I believe our small groups should operate the same way, with the goal of connecting people to the two things that we need most in life, the Bible and other Christians. Those are the two things, as a believer, you need the most in your life. You need God's Word, and you need other believers, and small groups allow for both. And obviously, FCC has understood that. FCC has understood the importance of small groups. We've had them for several years now, but as Darren and I have continued to talk about how we can best fulfill Jesus' desire for us to make disciples, we believe that we can become even more intentional with how our groups function. We want to move from being a church with life groups, that is, life groups are one of the many things we do, to being a church of small groups. In other words, we want to make life groups the hub around which all of our ministry as a church revolves. And we believe structuring FCC in this way will help us to be even more biblical in the way we operate and help us to reach our goal of making disciples who can make disciples. As we make life groups more central to our discipleship process here at FCC, there are a few tweaks that we're going to be making in the few months, in the the next few months. And this morning, I want to talk about some of those things. The first is, beginning after Easter, we're going to be transitioning our life groups, all of our life groups, to become sermon-based. Now, that doesn't mean we won't have any groups that are not sermon-based, but our life groups will be sermon-based. Our groups that are not doing sermon-based will be called focus groups, and so we'll still have some of those. Oftentimes, men want to study things that are specific to men, or women want to specifically study things that may not interest men, or there may be other studies, like recently I did 30 Days to Understanding the Bible or How to Make Disciples, we will still do some of those things, but we're going to be moving our life groups to be sermon-based. In Acts 2.42, we get a glimpse of how the early church was structured, and the first thing we read in this verse is it says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. I don't know if you realize this, but every week, Pastor Darren spends about 20 hours preparing for his sermon. That's a lot of time that he's studying, that he's working hard, that he's praying, asking God to direct him to what the church needs to hear. And we want to leverage that teaching to get the most we can out of it. When a sermon is preached on Sunday morning, there are often three to five things that you are challenged to change about your life. That means in a month, you're challenged to change 12 to 20 things about your life. That's a lot. That's a lot of change. If you multiply that by 12 months of the year, it's even more. And unfortunately, what happens when we have too much to do is 
We simply don't do it, right? So if you're hearing sermons week after week that are challenging you to make changes in your life, and you're then going midweek and hearing a different Bible study, and that's challenging you to change two or three things in your life, and then you're doing daily devotions, and that's challenging you to change two or three things in your life, that's too many things to change. And what often happens is you don't do any of it. So you're growing up here, but you're not being changed here. In Bible times, the characters in the Bible who were known for doing exactly that were the Pharisees. I don't know if you remember, but Jesus did not respond well to Pharisees. Those were the people that he was always angry at because he said, you're like whitewashed tombs. You look great on the outside, but your heart are far from me. Your hearts are dead because you know a lot, but you're not being changed to be more like me. So we want to protect from that happening. So rather than piling on more and more studies throughout the week, we want you to really slow down and chew on one message each week. Remember, less is more. Because our goal is not head knowledge, but life transformation. I don't know about you, but I've seen people who have been in church for six decades and look nothing like Jesus. We can't allow that to happen. Granted, that's each individual's relationship with God. We can't force people to grow, but we have to do the best we can to create an environment for growth. So in our life groups, you have the opportunity to do things that you can't do in here. In your life group, you can ask questions about the sermon. You can't really do that in here, can you? I mean, you could try, but if anybody raises their hand, I'm not calling on you. You can ask other group members in your life group how they've implemented some of the things that you haven't applied to your life yet. You can look back on the sermon in the middle of the week and it serves as a reminder to focus on what you heard on Sunday and make sure you're applying it. How often have you forgotten by Tuesday or Wednesday what the sermon was even about? And meanwhile, you also have the opportunity to form relationships with others that can encourage you in your faith and help you to remain accountable to make the changes that you wanna make. And we believe making this change, becoming sermon-based in our life groups will increase attentiveness on Sunday morning. It will allow for more spirited discussion in the groups because everybody there is already prepared at least 35 minutes for the group, right? If they listen to the sermon. Currently, if you go to a group that's about another study, there's one person who is prepared, the teacher. I've been the teacher in many of those situations and I've asked the students, the others in the group, to go over the lesson before we meet so we can have a great discussion. And I say, okay, number one, what'd you put for that? Crickets. This way, everyone will have at least 35 minutes of preparation time. This will allow for more spirited discussion. It will also help our entire church to be focused and headed in the same direction. It also makes leading a group easier because much of the prep has been done for you. I write the lessons each week for these groups. That's part of my job. We've been doing that since August. There are a few of our groups that have already been sermon-based, and I email these worksheets out. They look kind of like this. You, you saw them out on the Connection Center today. If you happen to walk by there, you can go out and grab one. But for a teacher, the lesson is created for you. It's based on the sermon. There's a sermon recap, and then the questions are not knowledge-based, they're application-based. How do we apply what the sermon is about this week? By the way, I wanna show you how you can find these worksheets because if you're in a group, which we want all of you to be in, you can find them very easily every week on our app. So pull out your phone if you have our app. If you don't, you can download it real quick, but you probably won't be able to do it in time to keep up with me. But pull out your phone, open up our FCC Wachula app, You'll see some of this on the screen as well, but in the bottom right-hand corner, it says media. You can click on that. The fifth option down says sermon notes. If you click on that, all the past sermons will come up, and at the very top is the most recent sermon. So we went ahead and put up the notes today. Usually they will not be available till Monday because I have to hear Darren's sermon first and then create the worksheet on Monday, but since I was preaching today, I could go ahead and create it. So if you click on the top one, Becoming and Making Disciples, week one, it will come up with the next screen that shows the picture 
of our artwork for this sermon series, and there's a little cloud, and it says, Becoming and Making Disciples Week 1 Discussion Guide. If you click that, it will pop this worksheet up right there on your phone. So if you're in a life group, you can have access to the worksheet every week just by going to our app. You can prepare for it in advance, so when you go to your group, you've thought about the questions, and you can have a good discussion. The second reason we want to move to this type of structure is that it allows for hands-on learning. And here's what I mean. When we study how Jesus made disciples, and we consider how an average person grows spiritually, we find that there is more to discipleship than head knowledge. A huge piece of Jesus' disciples' learning came from being in relationship with him. Another piece came in learning from his teachings. But a third piece, a huge piece, also comes from the disciples being sent out with increasing responsibilities over the course of their time with Jesus. At first, they may have simply passed out baskets of fish and bread, but over the course of time, they were going out and preaching the gospel and casting out demons. Spiritual growth is no different 2,000 years later. When we hear something, and then we study it, and then we talk about it, and then we put it into action, our learning exponentially increases. That's because James 1.22 says, do not merely listen to the word, but do what it says. That's right. We have to put it into action. In light of this, what we want our groups to do is not only discuss together how to apply the sermon each week, but also to have opportunities to practice it together. We want every follower of Christ to get into the game when it comes to ministry. So moving forward, our groups will be encouraged and held accountable to serve together and to have outreach events together, like a neighborhood block party or a cookout so they can get to know their neighbors. Again, spiritual transformation doesn't just take place by head knowledge alone. We want to implement what we're learning. So we don't want our groups to get get stuck inside a classroom. We want them to get out and influence those around us and serve those around us and put our faith into action. Thirdly, we want to have a structure that empowers the body. We want to make sure FCC is structured like the Bible tells us it should be. For years and years as a pastor, I felt guilty when I read Ephesians 4, verses 11 and 12. This is what it says. Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so the body of Christ may be built up. For years and years, I I felt guilty when I read that because that's not how our church operated. Notice why Jesus installed church leaders to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. In other words, pastors weren't given to do all the work. They weren't given to lead all the meetings. They weren't given to do all the evangelism or community outreach. They weren't given to equip, they were given to equip the saints so they could build up the body of Christ. So when our life groups become the hub through which our church does ministry, everyone will be encouraged to minister to one another. Whatever gifts the Holy Spirit has given each person will be used within their group. So for instance, if your gift is hospitality, you might help prepare the home of the host. If your gift is mercy, you might minister to those in your group who are hurting. You might visit them in the hospital. You might pray with them. If your gift is administration, you can help with keeping attendance or coordinating dinner or the service projects. But within life groups, there will be a place for everyone to serve and live out the love of Christ to one another. In addition to this change of transitioning to sermon-based groups, we also want to be moving our groups to a semester-based system. We kind of do that now, but we want to do this a little more official, and there's a few reasons for this, but one of the big ones is it allows for easy on and off ramps. What I mean by that is there are times where visitors come, and we have life groups going on, and it's very intimidating if you're a visitor to join a group that's been going on for six months, because everybody's built a relationship, they know each other, they have inside jokes and all this stuff, and it's hard to just pop in and join a group like that, but If a semester ends and a new one begins and everybody's starting a life group, it's very easy for someone to come in and be part of that. It's also good for off-ramps. There are times where maybe as a leader, you don't sign up to lead because you know in a church if you volunteer to lead, you're there for eternity, right? 
I've asked people to be Sunday school teachers before, and they're like, oh, let me pray about that. Because they're like, I don't know if I want to do that for the next 20 years because I watched my mom get stuck in that position. This allows leaders to decide when they can do it and decide when they can end. It also allows people to graciously get out of a group. Sometimes you get into a group and it's just not a good fit personal, you know, personality-wise, and you're like, how do I get out of this group? When a semester ends, it's an easy way to get out. So it offers good on and off ramps, both for visitors, for people that are coming down to Florida from the north, and all these types of things. So the way we want to do this is just kind of like a a school semester. All our world kind of operates on a school schedule. We want to kind of work the same way. We have a fall semester, take off a month or so for holidays, have an early spring semester. We want to start another semester a couple weeks after Easter so that our Easter guests can easily get on a couple weeks after Easter and go till the end of the school year, and then we'll take off for the summer so people can travel and have breaks and do the normal stuff they do. We believe time off is healthy. So this morning, as we think about these things, I know it's a lot of information, and and I I don't get to preach very often, so I feel like when I'm preaching, uh, I'm just blasting you with a lot of information. I apologize for that. But this morning, as we think about this stuff, I want to leave you with the question of how will you respond? There are lots of different ways you could respond this morning. Perhaps you are visiting this morning and we're talking about groups and being part of this and growing spiritually and you're thinking like, I don't even, I've never even decided to follow Jesus. Maybe as you heard Pastor Ryan sharing the communion thought and he was talking about how Jesus took your sin upon himself and he died on the cross, taking the punishment that you and I deserve so that you could enter into a relationship with God through placing your faith in Christ and submitting your life to him. Maybe as you heard that, you didn't really even need to hear the sermon. You're just like, I need to do that. I recognize that I have sin and I need to be forgiven of that. I need to give Jesus my life. This morning, do that. There's no greater decision you could make than to submit your life to Christ. And so maybe this morning, that's your decision. You need to give your life to Christ. Maybe for you, though, you've done that, but you recognize that although you've been at church for years and years, your spiritual growth has kind of plateaued. Maybe there's something you're missing. Maybe, Maybe you need to recommit to being an active part of the body of Christ. And you need to choose today to being committed to FCC's life groups. Or maybe you're sitting there thinking, you know, I don't think I'm ready to like lead a group, but I wouldn't mind if people met at my house. Like I have a decent house. I have room for people to meet. Maybe you would volunteer to host a group. Or maybe you are sitting there thinking, hey, I'd have no problem leading a group. I'm I don't mind leading people into discussion. I don't have all the answers. I don't have all the knowledge, but I can, I can be hospitable, and I'm growing in my relationship with the Lord, and I want to help others. I don't mind leading a group. We really would love to see the majority of our church in a group, and right now we have about 12 groups. Honestly, I think we need to double that number. So we're going to need more leaders. Maybe God's tugging on your heart to lead a group, or perhaps you're tech savvy because the reality is we want those of you online to be in a group as well. And you're thinking maybe like, I don't know if I want to be out in public yet, or hey, I've been attending your church online for six months, but I don't, I've never even met personally people at your church. I would like to do that because I realize I'm connected to God, but I'm really not connected to the body of Christ. If you're kind of tech savvy, even just tech savvy enough to lead like a Zoom call, you could lead an online life group. We need a lot of online. Like we have more people attending now than ever because we have people all over attending online and we need groups for those who are online. So there may be lots of ways you want to respond today, but let's make 2021 the beginning of a new day of spiritual growth here at FCC. Let's make 2021 a new time for you spiritually to grow in Christ. I want to encourage you to choose today to focus your life on becoming and making disciples. Let's pray. Father, we love you and and we just thank you for inviting us to be part of your mission. It's amazing that you would invite us to continue the mission that Jesus began 
here on earth, that we could be part of that same ministry. God, we thank you for loving us enough to involve us in that mission. And Lord, this morning there are so many different ways that folks might need to respond, but Lord, you have a different plan for each of us. We're each in a different stage of growth with you. Some here this morning have never begun a relationship with you, and God, I pray that you would give them the courage to come forward and respond. Others have never taken the step to obey you in baptism. Maybe today is the day for that. Others, they, they've been connected to you, but they've never opened up that place of vulnerability to, to connect with other believers. And perhaps today is the day for them to make that decision. Lord, I pray that you would just move in each of our hearts, that you would help us to be sensitive to your spirit, and you would help us to respond. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. We're about to sing a song, and, and we call this a time of invitation, a song of invitation, because as we sing this song, we're asking you to respond to God. And as I was just saying, that could take place in so many different ways, but we want to give you the opportunity to respond. If you need to begin a relationship with Christ, I would love to talk to you about that. I'll be right down here in front. Just come down and talk to me. If you want to be baptized today, we can do that. We have changes of clothes. We have towels. We can do all that today. If perhaps you feel like you want to get more involved in being part of the body of Christ through our life groups, maybe that's a commitment you want to make today. Or perhaps you just need to come and pray. We have some people down front with lanyards. They're our prayer team. That is that is why they're down here. They're people that know they don't have it all together, but they love God and they love you and they would love to pray with you. You can just come down and talk to them. You can come down and kneel at the altar and just pray to God yourself, but use this time to continue worshiping God. And remember, part of worshiping God is responding to him. So as he's spoken to you this morning, use this time to respond. Would you stand and sing with us?
What a powerful phrase, I think, to end on this morning, Lord. You are our king. We just pray that as we leave this place, that, Lord, we will, we will take moments that we will chew on what we just heard today. And we will soak it in and we will, we will make a choice today to invest our life in what really matters. Becoming and making disciples. Lord, thank you for challenging our hearts today. Thank you for being present with us. And thank you for how much you love us. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Have a great week. Be blessed, everybody.